Welcome, Bhante. It is really a pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to have this interview with you today. Thank you. And let me begin by introducing uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey. Bhante Vimala Ramsey is a Mahathira monk. He has been a monk for more than 35 years. Yeah. And uh, he's currently the abbot of Tamasuka Meditation Center. And he is one of the monks that I have met whose teachings are based on the earliest and most comprehensively recorded teachings of Buddha, uh, straight from the suttas, as he says. And uh, why it's a very special moment for me is because for a brief period, I had the opportunity to have a temporary ordination as a Samanera monk while at the uh, Damasuka Meditation Center with uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey. So, Bhante, very welcome once again. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this conversation with you. And to begin with, let me ask you the most obvious question one can ask a monk. But the, from your point of view and from, uh, from the wisdom of all the knowledge you have and the experience you have, what really is mindfulness? <laughs> mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. In other words, your mind is with your object of meditation and it gets distracted. How did that happen? It didn't all of a sudden jump over. Oh, yeah. It's part of a process. And when your mindfulness is strong, you can see what happens first and what happens after that, and what happens after that. So when your mind is on your meditation, it's very still. Then it starts wobbling. Your mind starts wobbling and you start having tiny little thoughts and they get bigger and bigger until you're distracted all the way. Mindfulness is being able to observe that. Okay. And if you, if I might draw a little further on that question is, how does sharpening mindfulness help lay people? People who may not be monks and are not monastics may not even have a formal meditation practice. Well, be more aware of what you're thinking while you're thinking it and how your mind gets distracted. Right. You're, when you're able to see that you're reading something and all of a sudden you're thinking of something else, yeah. you catch that more quickly and come back so you, you start training your mind to stay with what you want to be, uh, your attention to be on. Yeah. And, and that is so important because one of the greatest challenges in the modern life is of all the distraction that is coming at us, both from the world outside and from inside. So I think that is perhaps uh, a very important quality for us to cultivate. Yes. And uh, now switching from mindfulness to completely the other end of the spectrum, in the Buddhist philosophy, uh, if we can call it that, or uh, there is the concept which is approximately translated as craving. Right? I would like you to explain in layman terms a little bit about what is craving and why is there so much conversation in Buddha's teaching about craving? Okay, this is, this is actually easy. <laughs> okay, we're made up of five different things, mm -hmm. the psychophysical process. We have a physical body. We have feeling, not emotional feeling, just feeling. feeling yeah. Pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. We have perception. Perception and feeling are always together. When a painful feeling arises, your mind says, that's painful. That's perception that said that. Or if it's pleasant, that's pleasant. You have thoughts, you have consciousness. Okay, a feeling arises. It's either painful or, or uh, pleasant. <clears throat> as soon as that arises, right after that feeling, there is something that occurs in your mind, and that is craving. What is craving? Craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. But, yeah. If it's a pleasant feeling, I like it. If it's a painful feeling, I don't like it. 
Now, the key of this is I. <laughs> I is a false belief in a personal self. That's mm -hmm. when you're taking something personally. Right. That's the definition of craving. <laughs> I like it, I don't like it. How do you recognize craving when it arises? That's key. And you'll notice that every time you have a thought, every time a feeling arises, every kind, any kind of thing distracts you a bit, you, you have tension and tightness in your head. Now, your, your brain is like this. Mm -hmm and you have a membrane that goes around your brain. The meninges, right? And that's the meninges. Yeah. Meninges is basically just a bag. Mm -hmm. So when, every time there's a thought or a feeling or a sensation, your brain expands a little bit against that meninges and it causes a tension or tightness. That's how you recognize craving when it arises. A lot of people that are teaching meditation, they don't tell you about this. Craving, yeah, it's not brought up. Yep. And so they don't notice it. Yeah. But after a period of time, they start complaining about having a lot of tightness in their head. That is craving. craving yeah. So what do you do to let go of the craving? You relax, relax that tension and tightness in your head. And when you relax, you'll feel kind of like an expansion happening and a softening of your mind. That is called the cessation of craving. So every time you have a distracting thought, you recognize that your mind is not on your object of meditation. You release that distraction. How do you release it? You release it by not keeping your attention on that distraction. Then you relax. You're letting go of that tension and tightness now. Right after that, your mind becomes very clear, very bright, and there are no distractions. That's pulling your attention away. So this is what we call the pure mind. mind. Yep. Because there's no distractions, you have let go of that craving, now you bring up something that's wholesome. You bring up a smile. We re-smile a lot. What does a smile do? It does a couple of things. One, the more you can smile during the day, the better your mindfulness during the day okay. becomes. Absolutely. Absolutely true. And you bring that smiling, pure mind back to your object of meditation. You return to your object. Now, I teach both kinds of meditation. I, I teach more than one kind, let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. uh, I teach loving kindness meditation, and I also teach mindfulness of breathing. And there are other meditations that I teach also. The thing that you want to understand is you want to keep your attention on your object of meditation. It doesn't matter how many times your mind gets pulled away. Just because your mind got pulled away doesn't mean you have to be frustrated or you're a failure. That happens until you get more and more used to staying with your object of, your meditation. Object of meditation, with loving kindness or with the breath. Yeah. 
But both of these kinds of meditation has the smile in it. <laughs> okay. True. The smile, yeah. it improves your mindfulness, so you become much more aware, mm -hmm. much more quickly. Yeah. And your mind is much more at ease right. when you're smiling and it can bring joy up. Joy is a happy feeling, there's some excitement in it, and you start going, ah, oh, this is why I wanted to meditate. <laughs> this, is, this is the reason. This is really good. This is good, yeah. So, the more you can smile, the better your mindfulness is, the faster your progress is with the meditation. There was a lot to pack in an answer, right? <laughs> but that is how it is to talk to you about the I always say, it's like drinking from a fountain of wisdom. No matter how much you drink, you will always remember there was so much that flowed by, you cannot hold on to. But I, I think uh, in your uh, answer, you, you brought out three very important aspects, and I will dive a little bit deeper into each one of them one at a time. You, know, okay. you talked you talk about the concept of no permanent self, the anatta, or an Atman from the Buddha doctor, we'll return to that. And I think you summarize the six-hour technique and yeah. the relax and the smile step as well. But from craving, I want to bridge to something that lay people have difficulty understanding, especially in some sense uh, when we talk about the Four Noble Truths and the core teachings of Buddha, the concept of suffering as translated from Dukkha arises. Now, suffering in colloquial language, as people understand, has to do with pain and something unpleasant and so on yeah. and so forth. However, there is this very, very different degree of richness and depth in what Buddha is saying when he talks about dukkha, yeah. and but very approximately translates to suffering. So I thought, let me, let me take a segue to that and ask you, what is dukkha? How would you explain that to someone? Um, according to the suttas, it's not getting what you want. <laughs> That's very well said. Wanting something and then not getting yeah. what you want. Or getting something that you don't want. Want, yeah. Both are dukkha. Okay. It's holding on yeah. and taking it personally. personally yeah. That's what the the craving actually is. Yeah. Now, when the Buddha was talking about meditation, mm -hmm. he said that there's three parts to the meditation. meditation. Yeah. The first part is practicing your generosity. Sanatri, yep. Now, the thing with the generosity is people think that it has to be something that's physical. And it can be mental, too. Mm -hmm. If you say something kind to someone else, you're giving them your love and happy feeling. Yeah. So generosity is not just about physically, I'm going to give this to you. Yeah. And the more you practice your generosity, your kindness towards other people around you, the lighter your mind becomes. Yeah. The second part of meditation is keeping the five precepts. Five <laughs> precepts are lust or greedy mind, hatred or aversion Sin. mind, yeah. sleepiness, dullness, restlessness, anxiety, and doubt. When any of these five things come into your mind, you're no longer meditating. Now you're getting caught up in your thoughts about one of these things. Now, the Buddha gave the uh, five precepts as a recommendation. It's not Commandments. A commandment <laughs> at all. The yeah. Buddha never gave any commandments. commandments he, yeah. he just gave recommendations. <laughs> and the closer you can be to keeping your precepts without breaking them, it turns into a protection for you. 
and it also makes your mind more happy. happy. Yeah. Now, when you break a precept, let's say you tell a little white lie, that's still telling a lie. So, when you tell or say something that's not true, a small voice in your mind says, that's not true. I shouldn't have said, have said that. that. Yeah. And you take that personally. You feel guilty because you said it. But you shine it on. I mean, you, you just uh, don't think about it but anymore. It, yeah. Except when you're trying to purify your mind through meditation. meditation. Absolutely. And when you purify your mind through meditation, you're going to have to recognize this hindrance as a wrong belief and a guilty feeling in a personal self. As soon as you begin to let go and relax that craving, you've purified your mind. You've let go of that unwholesome feeling and your mind is clear yeah. your mind is bright your mind is very alert and then you bring up something wholesome a smile, a smile. Yeah. and bring that smiling wholesome mind back to your object of meditation this is how you progress in meditation. This is how you let go of any kind of distraction that pulls your attention away. The more you can do this, recognize that your mind is distracted, release the distraction, relax the tightness caused by that distraction, re-smile, Return to your object of meditation and repeat staying with your object of meditation as long as you can. Now, <clears throat> what I said a little while ago was just because your mind gets distracted doesn't mean you're a failure. It's just what minds do. It, it's just the nature of mind. Right, yeah. So when you relax, you let it be there by itself. You don't keep your attention on it. You don't make a big deal out of any kind of thing that pulls your attention away. I don't care if it's sadness or anger or fear or anxiety. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters is what you do with what arises in the present moment. So, if you fight with what's happening in the present moment, you don't like this feeling of anger or sadness or dissatisfaction of some sort, and you try to control your feeling with your thoughts, you're going to have those thoughts come up a lot yeah. bigger and more intense. And that feeling is going to get bigger because you're feeding it with your attention. That's why you need to see that distraction, let it be there. Don't keep your attention on it anymore. Don't make it into a big deal. Every time you make it into a big deal, the pain becomes bigger, yep. more intense. It takes a little practice to be able to do this, but as you start to see how this process actually works, it gets easier and easier. And as a result, you start letting go of your heavy emotional upsets, your dislikes and your dissatisfactions. You start not getting so caught up in them. If you use release, 
relax, smile, and come back to, if it's with your daily activities, smiling some more. <laughs> You're following the Eightfold Path. Yeah. So, if you have 50 distractions while you're sitting and 50 times you let it be and you relax and smile and come back, that is a good meditation. If you try to push it away, I don't want this, I, I, I hate this feeling, I, I want that person to do something and they're not doing it and I'm mad. If you don't get it, make a big deal out of that feeling, you allow it to be, you relax, smile, and come back, you start developing your personality so that you have more happiness and joy coming up. And this leads to a quieter mind, a mind that's more relaxed, at ease, and accepting. Thank you, Bhante. That was a great answer. And in that answer was also the answer to one more question that I had planned for Bhante about explaining the six hours. And I think we will close with that later, but I think a lot of gist of it. I almost felt like a feeling of deja vu. I remember <laughs> when I was in the robes uh, at the SMC, on the second day, uh, you came up for lunch and the, the only instruction you gave me at that point was, you are not smiling enough. <laughs> you need to <laughs> smile more. So it was almost like a deja vu. Uh, I, 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 now we've talked about craving. We've talked about suffering. We've talked about how to deepen the meditation practice. I'd like to ask you about this concept. There is a lot of conversation in the self-development world about self-unfoldment, self-actualization, self-realization, self-development. And then we have the uh, we have the Buddhist principle, if I may say, or uh, concept of anatta or anatman uh, in another language of not self. And I don't give it that definition. Okay. <laughs> okay, because that's really confusing. Yes, it is. It certainly I is. I give it the definition of seeing the impersonal nature. Yeah. No personal self. No personal self. Yes. Yeah. There's still self. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's not not self. Not self. Yeah. But seeing the impersonal nature is what happens as soon yeah. as you let go of the craving. Yeah. The and your mind is very clear. Yeah. And you're seeing this as a process. Right. Rather than a personal yeah. attachment. Yeah. In, in fact, that brings me to, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with Chris Cullen at the Oxford University, and we were talking about uh, a not personal self, and I, and I mentioned to him, perhaps one of the major source of suffering is the craving for an I. Yeah. That, you know, the, the, the concept and belief that there is a real me, you know, there is a personal me, and from there, you know, the, the cascade of that process starts. So it, what you said about uh, not personal self is a very astute way to articulate that. Yeah, and, and, and it's a lot more easy to understand, understand. Yeah. especially when you're doing the practice at that time. At that time. And see for yourself. Yeah. That's why I tell a lot of people that come and they want to learn meditation with yeah. me, I tell them that they are their own teacher. teacher. Yeah, yeah. And that's important. Yeah because you have to see this for yourself, Self. and it's not an intellectual <laughs> uh, practice. Yeah, that is true. And uh, it's, in many cases, meditation gets confused with contemplation. Yeah. So uh, the, 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 the word meditation itself has uh, become so democratized in some sense and so generalized mm -hmm. that sometimes it does amaze me, stuff that people do and then they say, that's their meditation. So, uh, yeah. so I, know I, I get the point about being able to do everything mindfully, but uh, but uh, by staying in the moment, by fo focusing on what you're doing, not getting distracted with your thoughts or emotions that may come up or other forms of feeling. But to classify everything as meditation seems to have become fashionable. 
Well, I just got through writing a book, Life is Meditation. Meditation, meditation is life. It's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful book. And yeah. it is part of living. Living, yeah. You have hindrances arise, yeah. whether you're sitting in meditation or you're out for a walk. Right. You still have hindrances that can arise. So you can do, you can let go of the pain of that by practicing the six arts. Six arts, yeah. And, and, and on that point, uh, we, we've talked a lot about how we can sit with meditation, how we can use six arts for meditation. And I opened my conversation by asking about mindfulness. I think it's appropriate. Let me ask you about okay. what is meditation and how would you explain to someone who's never meditated before? Well, meditation is being able to observe how mind's attention actually works. Works, yeah. And how to let go of the suffering that we can get caught up in, the mm -hmm. boredom, the sloth uh, and torpor, sloth and torpor the, 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 the restlessness, yes, yeah. all kinds of different Hindrances, things. Yeah. Uh, the the greed of I want this to be the way I want it to be <laughs> when I want it <laughs> that <truth> way, way. <laughs> and when it's not there is suffering. Suffering, yeah, true. Yeah. But every time you try to fight with the present, yeah, you're causing yourself suffering. Oh, absolutely, the present will still be here, but with suffering. Where <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you are, yeah. Well said, yeah. well said, and. Uh, so, in the in the Buddhist doctrine, there is also a lot of conversation around enlightenment, right? Yeah. And uh, um, and there's been a lot of commentary around it also. And there's there's marked difference in how enlightenment is in some way tendentially referred to in the suttas, and how later on in Vishuddhimagga there is a lot of commentary around it. So I'd love to hear from you what your view of uh, a very basic question: What really is enlightenment? I tell you something you don't know, I've enlightened you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't call what the Buddha teaches enlightenment. Mm -hmm. I call it awakening. Awakening. Because we're walking around yeah. in a dream, yeah. in a dream of our own uh, mishmash of thoughts and feelings yeah. and, and yeah. got to do this. Got to do all, that. All yeah. of the, those so, kind of yeah. things. When you become clear, yeah. you become more awake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you start to see how this process works. Yeah. And the clearer you become, the happier you become. Yeah. It, it, it is my understanding that the word Buddha literally means the fully awakened one. Right. That, that, yeah. Yeah, I know that there's, uh, especially in America, yeah. there's people that think that that's his name. <laughs> yeah. Buddha, Buddha said Xavier, this. Buddha, Buddha said did that. that. Yeah, yeah. No, it, yeah. It's an honorific. Yeah. It's yeah. how to be respectful when you say the Buddha. The Buddha, yeah. The awakened one. one. And your mind actually takes a step down when you do it in a sincere way. Yeah, yeah. And it just in interest of trivia, his name actually was Siddhartha Gautama, the, right. the, the prince uh, of the, the son of the king yeah. of the Sakya kingdom, also later on called Sakya Muni. Yeah. And in fact, in, in Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist cosmology, you study about many Buddhas that have preceded the Buddha, and there's also conversation about Maitreya Buddha, who's supposed to. Who will be coming. Who will, will be coming. So it, it, it's great that you clarified that, you know, for, for our listeners, that the Buddha is an honorific yeah. to refer to the fully awakened one. And, uh, and while we are talking about awakening, uh, in the world today, there is so much that is going on that I sometimes have this conversation with my students and I say, there's a lot of tranquilized obviousness in life. We just tend to run on an automatic pilot, putting one foot in front of the other, because of a conditioned mind that I got to do this, I got to do that, and the whole full catastrophe of life that we need to deal with. And, uh, and I also have a conversation with them about how uh, mindfulness and meditation can help people get out of that autopilot and find more compassion, more joy, more fulfillment, more equanimity. 
And so I was hoping that you could say something about the millennial generation, where uh, millennial generation, I mean, I know people have all sorts of comments about it, but I think they, they have been born into an environment with more distractions than ever before. And how yes, can and, they... and a lot of them are becoming more and more aware of the suffering that they're doing. Absolutely, absolutely. And they're, they're looking for a way, way to get to. out of that. Yeah, yeah, so true. One of the problems that people have with Buddhism is they think it's a religion. <laughs> and it, that's the farthest thing away from religion that there is. <laughs> this is mind science. <laughs> this is being able to look at how you treat yourself yeah. and how you cause your own pain. Yeah. If you get angry at somebody and they say something you didn't like, yeah. Yeah. you wind up blaming them for yeah. making you angry. And, and, and the anger is happening where you are, not where they are. Right. In that moment of choice, you chose to be angry. Right. Yeah. And being mindful means Letting go of that. that. Yeah, absolutely. So you don't get so caught up in your emotional upset. Now, uh, there is a feeling that arises. Right after that, there's craving. You either let it go or not. not yeah. Right after that, you have... Uh, Clinging. Clinging. Clinging is your thinking about, your yeah. opinions, your ideas. Ideas. And taking what you said and thought very personally, and you really hold on to, <laughs> this is my opinion, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. And that causes suffering in itself. But the thing right after that, yeah. this is what I call your habitual, emotional uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. you, it's your... Uh, I just lost what I was going to say. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, it's your habitual tendencies. Jeez. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? I have a feeling come up. Let's say depression, that seems to be a favorite. Yeah. <laughs> what, is, what is that feeling? It's painful. Yeah. I don't like it. I want it to stop. Yeah. So, what you try to do is think with thoughts your depression and how you don't like it. Yeah. And you keep on coming back, and the more you think about a painful thing, the bigger and more intense that pain yes. becomes. Yeah, yeah. So that's not the way to get rid of depression. Yeah. I gave a talk for a psychiatrist, yeah. and he said, well, how are you supposed to get rid of depression? I said, laugh. <laughs> Well, he said, it's not funny. <laughs> and that made me laugh. <laughs> because it is funny. It is, in, at some level, yeah. Because you're caught, yeah. and you don't see it. Mm -hmm. As soon as you laugh, you go from, I'm depressed and I don't like it, to, well, it's only this depression. Yeah. Did I ask this depression to come up? No. Well, whose is it then? Why are you taking it personally? It's only a feeling. Yeah. You can't make that feeling change. Yeah. You have to let it be by itself, relax and smile. Yeah. In fact, the latest research in depression is, uh, is pointing out to this that a lot of cognitive therapy techniques are being borrowed to add more nurturing activities so that you can reframe and decenter yourself from depressive feelings when they arise. And, uh, and, and and that's that, mindfulness. Yeah, absolutely, right that's that, that's mindfulness, and they are bringing the focus back more and more to engaging in more nurturing activities at the time when those depressive feeling arises. Nothing is more nurturing than having a smile. So, <laughs> so I think science is eventually even uh, the <coughs> psychiatric they'll, they'll science. They'll learn eventually. They, 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 yeah, yeah. 
We have used the word feeling many times. If I'm not mistaken, the original Pali word is Vedana. Right. right. And, uh, and it is, Vedana itself is different from how in English sometimes we understand feeling as, as an emotional feeling. You know, right. there can be an eye feeling, there can be an ear feeling. So I was hoping that for people to get the right context of uh, 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 when you say depression is a feeling, if you could say a little I'm, bit I'm about feeling. I'm talking feeling about is. an emotional feeling, your habitual tendencies. tendencies. I always think this when that arises. arises. Now, that has nothing to do with mindfulness. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with your awareness. That happens just because of your old habit of acting this way when that arises. When you start practicing and understanding feeling is only pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, it's not emotion, and it's not yours personally. <laughs> a feeling arises. You have a pain in your knee. Did you ask that pain to come up? It just came up. Did you say, I want this pain. I haven't <laughs> had pain for a long time. <laughs> no, nobody's going to do that. Yeah. You're seeing more and more clearly how the process works. And when you start seeing how this process works, then you'll start letting go of it more and more easily. easily yeah. One of the things that I tell my students a lot is that you have to stop being hard on yourself. You have to start being kind to yourself. You're going to make a mistake then you're going to think about how dumb you were <laughs> and how much you, sh you shouldn't have done it, yeah. and it's going to come up over and over and again. over yeah. again. That's habitual emotional tendency. Yeah. So you have to learn, no, I made a mistake. Yeah. Okay, I forgive myself for making a mistake. Yeah. I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be perfect. Why do I can criticize myself when I make a mistake? You need to be kind to yourself. You need to be grateful that you made a mistake because that way you won't do it again. <laughs> and the more you practice gratitude, yeah. the clearer your mind becomes. Yeah. In fact, it's been, the studies have shown that depression, uh, the leading indicator of depression is self-critical thoughts, judgment and evaluation that works at a ruminating uh, process and they call it the vicious cycle yeah. because every negative self-critical thought brings out more self-critical thought, more self-critical thought and then eventually it becomes anxiety and over a period of time depression. So what you said is so, so consistent with what people are finding. Laugh. Laugh, smile and laugh. You make a mistake. Okay, <laughs> fine. So what? What's the big deal? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time you laugh, you let go of that false belief in a personal self, and I'm dumb and I don't like it. <laughs> you let go of that. Mother, I'd like to pick up a theme oh, in, in your last answer. Uh, you talked about one of the misunderstandings people can have that... Uh, Buddhism is a religion, and yeah. I think, uh, and in all fairness, I think part of it is also fueled by how Buddhism is practiced in some parts of the world, you right. know, the temples and rituals and rites and, and the flutes and everything else, and, and obviously, uh, you know, your teachings go right back to the suttas, the original uh, words of Buddha, so to say, as, as closely preserved as possible. May I draw you into an inquiry as to what do you see is the future of Buddhism, given all that's happened to the world and all that's happened to the teachings of Buddha now? Well, believe it or not, I see Buddhism softening the blow of the dissatisfaction and dislike of what's happening right now. Yes. And it's starting to change things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I was in Asia for 12 years. I came back to this country <laughs> to help soften the blow. blow and, yeah. and I teach people how to be happy. Happy, yeah. And when they're happy, then they say, well, I want to be a teacher. Yeah. Okay, you teach by your example. Example, absolutely. And you teach other people how to smile and laugh. 
and have fun. <laughs> when, when you first came, that was one of the first things I said to you. You're not laughing enough. <laughs> you need to laugh more. I remember you were sitting on the right and you were playing with the dog and, yeah. uh, and I was busy with my food and you said, you need to laugh more. It took me a while to get, get hold of that one. That was a good one. Uh, now I imagine you saying that. Every time I get too serious, <laughs> if Mante was here, he would tell me you need to laugh more. <laughs>